If you were to ask the average person on the street what they think of when they think of money, probably nine out of ten times they would think of currency. Now, I know that some stackers out there uh, give that a negative connotation and they think of money as being gold and silver. And you younger generations, when you think of money, you probably think of things like Venmo. But for us older folks and for the generations immediately before and immediately after, when we think of money, generally speaking, we think of currency, paper money, and that's what this video is about. Uh, welcome to the channel. If you've never been here before, my name is White Cross and I'll be your guide on this journey today. If you are one of my returning subscribers, you know I really appreciate you guys. Thank you again for being with me here in this new edition of the World of Coin Collecting video series. Glad to be able to share this with you today. This video is about currency and we're going to take just a general overview of currency and we're going to do that by watching kind of a, a trip with one particular piece of currency as it unfolded over the last seven or eight years. I think it's kind of an interesting journey and it gives us an opportunity to talk about some of the uh, aspects of currency collecting and some of the nomenclature, some of the ideas behind it, some of the things that happen when you are a currency collector. If you are new to the channel, I like to begin each of my videos with a simple disclaimer. That is, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not trying to offer you any kind of financial advice. I'm simply trying to share some of my experience having bought and sold precious metals and rare coins for the last 30 or 40 years. And I also like to begin each of my videos with a couple of concepts that we can kind of fold back into the subject that we are talking about. In this case, I've got a couple of them for you. The first one is pick numbers, P-I-C-K numbers. Pick numbers refer to the numbers that were first kind of invented by a man named Albert Pick in 1975 when he published the first standard catalog of world paper money. And the, the pick numbers are essentially a catalog number. So there are slight variations from bill to bill when you're talking about currency, as there are with things like coins. But with bills, they can be a, kind of a nuanced thing. So Pick designed a series of numbers that he applied to each of the bills that are in circulation. And they continue to issue Pick numbers to this day. Every time a new piece of currency is released, it gets a new Pick number. So a Pick number is simply the catalog number that refers to a very particular bill. And that will come into play a little bit later. We're going to mess around with Pick numbers just a little bit. And the other concept I wanted to share is a little bit more of a broad concept that I like to use across all spectrums of collecting in my own collecting and my own collections and that I have for several years, and that is research. And this form of research is really kind of an interesting uh, three or four prong approach, but it really goes something like this. When I find a coin or a banknote or um, a piece of art that I really, really like, I look at um, several different factors. The first one is that I try to look at mintages. And mintages are particularly easy to find when it comes to coins, especially American coins, US coins. All we have to do is flip open our red book and it gives us mintage figures. Here you'll see the mintage figures for the 1921 peace dollar, one of my favorite coins. The next step, after checking mintages, and mintages just give you kind of a general idea of how many pieces were minted from coin to coin, from bill to bill, from other arts, uh, objects of art, or whatever else it is that you're trying to collect. It gives you kind of a very surface level idea of how many pieces were originally made. Now, unfortunately, mintages don't take into account attrition, which we talk about often on this channel, things that are uh, lost because they are stolen, they are damaged, they are melted. Uh, misplaced forever, accidentally thrown away, left out in the rain. If you're talking about comic books, if you're talking about sports cards, things that are left in the garage, left in the attic where they get dry rot, attrition affects everything. And mintages don't take attrition into account. They are simply the origin, the start of that story. But they do provide very good information. So the first thing that I do is, generally speaking, I try to find the mintage, the number of pieces that were originally made. Second, I look for population reports, and we're going to talk about a couple of the certification services that do certify banknotes a little bit later, but since we're sticking with that 1921 peace dollar analogy, population reports 
are issued by the third party graders. Third party graders are, are a disinterested third party that will accept your comic book, your sports cards, your currency, your coins, and for a small fee, they will offer their opinion as to what the grade is, often, uh, often sonically sealing your coin, your sports card, in a tamper-resistant package so that it's easier for you to sell on an open market. Third-party graders. Third-party graders also publish population reports, and a population report simply shows how many um, objects they have graded of a particular year, a specific mint mark, a pick number. Uh, they'll tell you what grade they have certified pieces in, and they'll often give you a list. And it will be a relatively easy to read list where you can see, for example, how many 1965, uh, uh, 1921 MS65 piece dollars have been graded by one of the third party graders. In this case, we'll look at examples from PCGS. We'll look at that as a reference point. So first, check those mintage figures. Second, I check population reports. Now, population reports only refer to those pieces that have been graded by that third-party grader. But if you kind of learn how to read them, you'll learn to read between the lines, you can see just how many examples have been graded, and that gives you a very good idea of how many survivors there are, how many pieces have been graded, and if it is worth sending them in to have them graded. Sometimes you'll reach that point where pieces are, are so numerous that it really doesn't make any financial um, sense to send them into a third-party grader. Sometimes you'll also get the feel that pieces have been broken out in an attempt to get a higher grade from a third-party grader. Uh, population reports are a very important aspect of trying to figure out just how scarce and valuable something can be. And the third thing that I do is to check past auction sales. When you're looking at a reference like PCGS.com or you're looking at a reference like the Red Book, often that information is days or weeks or months old. In the case of the Red Book, it can be a year old or even older if you're looking at an older example of the Red Book. So while the information about the coin uh, again, with the 1921 piece dollar as an example, the dimensions of it, the weight of it, the purity of it, the mintage figures, all of that information is accurate. Less accurate are the price guidelines because honestly, once something like that is published, it's obsolete. The market takes over and that information grows stale very quickly. Still an incredibly valuable resource, one that you've heard me recommend over and over again, especially if you are collecting American coins. But when it comes to pricing something, doing that research, I look for uh, past auction closings and I look for the most recent examples possible. And often when you're talking about pieces that have been certified by a third party grader like PMG, which we'll talk about in a moment when it comes to currency or PCGS or NGC when it comes to coins, uh, you're going to be able to find an apples to apples comparison. In other words, you can find an exact date, well, again, with that 1921 peace dollar analogy. Let's look at a 1921 peace dollar in MS65 condition uh, with an NGC slab that is certified by NGC. You can look at pot past auction closings for that specific coin. That's a pretty precise measurement. And you can find recent auction closings that will give you an idea how much these things are selling for on the open market as recently as today. And that is a fantastic uh, piece of evidence to use when you're compiling a case to decide whether or not you want to purchase uh, a piece of currency, a coin, a sports card, a comic book, whatever it is that you are collecting. So research, a very key thing to do. And we're gonna talk about research a little bit later in this video as well. Not just for currency, it's across all different forms of collecting. So we talked about uh, research, we talked about those pick numbers. And the reason I wanted to bring all of this up is because, like I said, I wanna share uh, a journey of a very specific banknote, a very specific piece of currency, so you can kind of see how the market works in this very surface level introduction to the world of coin collecting where we're focusing on paper money, we're focusing on currency. About seven or eight years ago, I was at one of my local dealers 
And um, the dealer had just purchased a very large collection of currency. He had just purchased a very large banknote collection. And this was from a pretty astute collector who had been collecting for decades. And he had a very impressive collection. And one of the notes that caught my eye as people were uh, ogling these beautiful banknotes that had just come in was a 100 serang note from Tibet from right about World War II. We talked about this banknote just briefly in the introduction video to the world of coin collecting, and this is it. This is a beautiful hand-stamped wood-cut woodblock um, piece of art. At least that's what I'd like to think it is. This is a 100 serang note from right around that period of time, certified by PMG with a grade of 55 EPQ, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. This is an eye-catching note, so you, it's, it's completely understandable why this one would have really been noticeable when it was in the shop and I noticed it, and I immediately thought it was one of the greatest looking pieces of currency I've ever seen. It's loud, it's boisterous, this is an exciting piece of currency. This isn't just black and green like American currency. And all the different figures that you see here in very faint images here are allegorical symbols for the Tibetan religions uh, of this period of time. Interesting note with fascinating design, and it's on rough cut hand hewn paper. It's just got all the bells and whistles that make for a very interesting uh, piece of currency. So uh, I like this piece, and I was getting ready to make an offer when I realized that the dealer had just sold the example that was in this collection to another collector. And he turned around and walked out the door with it. And I thought that was probably my last opportunity that I was ever going to see one of these bills. But it stuck in my mind that this was an impressive piece of currency. And the funny thing about being a collector, especially if you're a coin collector who's been collecting for decades like I have, somehow you seem to inherit banknotes all the time. If it's in a rich uncle who leaves you a small coffee can full of uh, coins, there's almost always a wad of paper money, uh, you know, those Philippine pieces that he brought back from the war or those German hyperinflation period pieces that he brought back from the European front. Uh, you uh, go into a coin shop and you just happen to see something out of your corner of your eye that catches it and, and you decide to lay down a couple dollars to pick it up. And that's what's happened to me over time. You can see I've got a pretty wide variety of banknotes here. But that one banknote really stuck with me, and it really made an impression on me, so I started doing research. I started trying to find examples, and lo and behold, I was able to find a piece in February of 2017 through the auction company Heritage. I've mentioned Heritage a few times, especially if you look at the community section of the uh, White Cross Precious, Precious Metals and Numismatics YouTube page. You'll notice that I talk about Heritage auctions periodically. They are uh, one of the most respected coin and collectible auctioneers in the country, really in the world. And they are the place that I have purchased several of my long-term permanent collection pieces. I digress. I looked at this auction and it was for Asian currency and they just happen to have a few examples of this 100 string note from Tibet. So I did my research. Uh, I tried to find uh, recently closed examples at auctions. I tried to look up population reports and I was able to find some pretty good information about it. And the piece that caught my eye was this exact piece. This has been graded by the Paper Money Guarantee Company that is a subsidiary of NGC. We talk about NGC often. They are one of the two most respected third-party graders of coins. So PMG, a very respectable company to uh, offer an opinion about the grade of a banknote in this case. This is the 100 string note PMG 55 EPQ. This was up for auction and I put a bid in on it. Uh, I thought it was an exciting piece and I put in a bid of $160 way back in 2018 and I won. Now, uh, when you're buying at auction, you need to be careful of auction prices because often auctioneers will tack on an additional percentage as a buyer's premium. And then you often have to pay shipping and handling on that piece too if it's not a local auction. So even though my bid was $160, uh, and we'll take a look at it here. When I when the dust finally settled and I actually settled my bill, I paid about $192 for it. 
I wasn't unhappy with that. Maybe a little bit more than I wanted to pay, but it was a great example and it was a graded example. There are counterfeits of a lot of, of currency pieces out there. There are a lot of counterfeits of this bill, probably because of its original uh, location close to China, which is obviously responsible for a lot of counterfeits. But having a bill that was certified by PMG was worth it to know that I was getting an authentic bill that was in really good shape. I mentioned before that it had the EPQ designation. The EPQ designation is uh, a note that they apply to bills if they qualify for it. And the EPQ note is the opinion of the third party grader that the paper is completely and wholly original. The paper upon which the bill is stamped. There are ways to chemically treat something, to repair something that has been ripped. Uh, often bills have pinholes in them and uh, devious people and experts can repair those to the point where they are difficult for the average collector to note. But uh, PMG actually gave this note uh, an EPQ, that is Exceptional Paper Quality Designation, indicating that this paper was wholly original and in good shape. And I liked having that extra designation. We'll talk a little bit more at length about third-party graders and specific designations in the upcoming videos in the series on third-party graders and coin grading. But out the door, $192. I was happy to get that bill, and it was nice to know that it was a permanent part of my collection. But then I started doing more research, and it just so happened that in September of 2018, a few months after I had purchased and received this bill, uh, Heritage was having another auction of very similar pieces, and in that auction, they had a 100 SRANG note from Tibet PMG graded 65 EPQ, and you'll recall that the one that I had purchased was a 55. Bills are graded on a very similar scale uh, as to the uh, grading scale that is used on coins, that Sheldon scale, which is a scale of 1 to 70, that's condition. One being almost a theoretical horrible condition, 70 being an almost theoretical pristine condition. So bills and, and coins fall somewhere on that continuum. As we said, this is a 55, so on a scale of 1 to 70, that's a pretty solid grade. That's a very good grade. Uh, it's technically about uncirculated. Um, and this bill that was being auctioned in September of 2018 was a 65, so rated 10 points higher in condition, that much more pristine, and it too was an EPQ. Once again, exceptional paper quality, graded by PMG. I'll show a picture of that bill as it was up for auction. Now, uh, I couldn't resist the opportunity to throw a bid at something that was 10 points higher. It looked fantastic. It was graded by the same graded company. It had that same EPQ designation. I didn't think I had anything to lose because worst case scenario, I could always sell the lower graded one and uh, I would probably make out okay in the end. So uh, I threw a bid at it and uh, I won it. That low ball bid that I threw at it was $360 this time, so about twice as much as I'd paid for the 55 but with the buyer's premium and the shipping and everything else out the door, it was $432. Remember, this is September of 2018. One thing that the um, bill had that the, the uh, EPQ65 had that the earlier bill that I'd purchased did not have was a different pick number. And we talked about pick numbers at the beginning of this video. This is kind of the catalog number. Pick 11A for this bill means that this is kind of the standard boilerplate version of this bill. There's nothing special about it. There's nothing unique about it. This is kind of the the main type of bill for this bill. Pick number 11A. So if you'll look very closely here at the auction for the uh, EPQ65, it was a pick number 11 D, a different designation. So before I threw that bid at it and won it, I did a little bit of research because Heritage's auction listing didn't really ex uh, explain what that meant. Now, if you looked very closely at the image of the bill as it was being auctioned, you could notice that there was a little bit of something different up here in this uh, label of the bill, and that was that this was an unusual inverted seal type of bill. I don't read Tibetan, I don't read Chinese, but if you look very closely, uh, and we'll take a look at this example, this again, the 11A, the kind of the standard version of it, this seal right here 
as with all the different colors and shapes that are applied to this bill, a different wood block stamped into it for each of these colors and shapes. And on this 11A, the standard version, this seal is upright and then the correct orientation. But in 11D, this seal is turned upside down. It is the incorrect orientation. It is an inverted seal error. That was an interesting difference between the two. As with um, coins and bills and just about any collectible, sometimes an error can be quite valuable. I'll give the example here of a 1955 double-dyed Lincoln cent. This is uh, where the 1955 date is doubled, and it's very easy to see. It's a very clear difference. This is one of the most popular error coins in the entire United States coin panoply. And it's visible with the naked eye, and it's an exciting error. So that makes it very interesting. This makes it very highly collectible. This is a very sought-after coin. But sometimes er errors can be negatives. For example, if you have a rare date coin that is pristine, that is a beautiful piece, and you really want this one special date to be the best example you can get, but that coin has a lamination error. That's when there are the processing of the planchet goes wrong and the, the metal actually flakes off. Or you have a strike-through error. Maybe a piece of fabric got into the die as it was pressing the coin, and that piece of fabric leaves an imprint on the coin. That can be valuable sometimes, but if that error is distracting in any way, it can actually be a negative. This is something that's difficult for new coin collectors to understand. Not every error is a collectible and not every error is de desirable. Sometimes they can be distracting enough that they actually kind of ruin a piece. So be very careful if you are talking about errors and you want to explore that section of our hobby. Fascinating section, but it can be tricky. In this case, I didn't have enough information. My research wasn't complete and I didn't know for certain if having that inverted seal was a positive or a negative. But my research did tell me, at least at the time, that it was the only and the highest graded example of pick number 11D with that inverted seal on it. And that was pretty exciting to me, at least. I was willing to take a gamble on the piece in the first place, knowing that it was the highest graded example of pick 11D for the 100 Srang bills from Tibet added a little bit more excitement to it. I plopped down my money, I received the bill a few weeks later, and I was pretty happy with my purchase. So now you see how important research can be when you're talking about any collectible, but it is very important in the world of currency, of paper money. And we've seen the difference between those pick numbers. There can be a vast gulf, just as with a, a mint mark for a coin, or a date for a coin, between one pick number and another pick number. In this case, it was 11A versus 11D. So I received the 11D, that's the uh, 65 EPQ version of it, and I had a great chance and opportunity to look at both of these uh, bills close up. And I put them side by side, and I spent a, a pretty good amount of time going over it. And my intention had been originally, once I got the 65, I would probably sell the 55, and uh, cut my losses and have the highest graded example. But honestly, once I got them side by side and I could really take a good look at them, I didn't like the 65 as much. And this is a really interesting aspect of being a coin collector, being a currency collector, being any kind of collector. Sometimes it doesn't matter how well highly graded a piece is, how well liked it is by other people, you really need to go with your gut. And my gut was telling me that the things that made me really fall for this bill the first time I saw it were much more evident in the 55 than they were in the 65. The bright colors, the centering of it, everything about it that I liked so much the first time I saw that bill that I missed out on in my coin dealer's uh, uh, collection, uh, as it walked out the door and I thought it was the last time I would see it, was more prevalent in the 55 than in the 65. Now, I'm not dating, uh, doubting PMG is great. I'm sure they know exactly what they're talking about. But it just didn't spark my interest the way that the 55 did. So I decided to sell the 65. 
And interestingly, I mentioned before that Heritage didn't make a very big deal that this was the 65 was the highest graded 11D pick number at the time. But you can believe that when I listed this piece for sale, I touted that. I really reinforced that and I invited um, potential buyers to look at the population reports at PMG so they could see for themselves that this was, at least at the time, the very highest graded example of the 11D with that inverted seal printed on it. And lo and behold, within a few hours of me listing this piece, I was contacted by one of the largest currency dealers in uh, Asia. And they bought that bill from me that I had uh, paid $432 for, for well over $700. So I was delighted. And it essentially paid for the 55 EPQ. Uh, it's an exciting aspect of our hobby once you reach a certain level of expertise to be able to buy and sell pieces. Uh, for me, it just gives me a little bit more capital to work with to improve my own collection, but it is a fun way to augment your experience if you think you have the uh, knowledge to start doing it. In this case, I kind of got lucky. I didn't know that the 11D pick number was a more valuable piece. In fact, it may not have been, but that dealer recognized that it was a very scarce version, the highest graded with a, a 65 grade and an exceptional paper quality designation that he took a gamble. And I thought that I had hit a home run. And I guess I kind of had. Uh, you know, that was several years ago. I had do almost doubled my money. I had paid for the 55. I was delighted with it. End of story. But I was researching again. And I continue to research on this piece. Uh, I always think it's a good idea for you to research if you have an unusual piece, whether it's currency, whether it's coins, sports cards, comic books, whatever it is that you have, keep your eye on those auctions. You know, even if you're not thinking, contemplating about selling something, it's always a good idea to see where your pieces lie in the market. If you are going down in value, if you're going up in value, I like to keep kind of a mental toll of my best pieces, my top 20 pieces or so, so I can kind of gauge where they are in the market. And I was doing that uh, about a week and a half ago. I just happened to come across another auction listing, this from a company called Stacks and Bowers. They are another very well-respected auction company in the world of collectibles, particularly coins, but also currency. And in this Dax Bowers auction, they were uh, highlighting coins and, and paper money from uh, Hong Kong, one of their subsidiaries, and it was a focus of kind of Asian type currency. So this was an opportunity for me to kind of go through it really quickly. I searched on Srang notes and would you believe several of them popped up? Certified examples, some of them quite low. These are pieces that had obviously been spent, and there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to collect lower end pieces, like the average circulated pieces that you see here before you, these pieces in large part actually changed hands. There is history there. There's something charming about a banknote or a coin that has actually been spent by people going back 50 or 100 years, 200 years. So they had some lower end examples of these 100 string notes, and they had some moderate examples, kind of like the one that I had decided to keep. But then I noticed that they had a 65 EPQ, and it was pick number 11D. Yes, in fact, it was the exact banknote that I had purchased back in 2018, September of 2018, and had gone to this large currency dealer in Asia. Now, it's probably changed hands several times since then, but this is, again, kind of a journey of this note, so you can see how this whole activity plays out over time. I watched that auction. It, the piece sold at auction over the last weekend, and the auction estimate was, I believe, $500 to $800. I'll put a picture of this auction so you can see what the auction estimate was. That's in keeping with what I had sold that bill, bill for back in 2018. By the time the dust settled, the bill sold for $1,680. So while I thought that I had hit a home run by selling it for $700 back in 2018, 
whoever had that bill up until just a few days ago was able to sell it for nearly $1,000 more than I had sold it for way back in 2018. That is just a great illustration, a great example, so you can see the journey of one piece of currency as it relates to doing research, to getting those pick numbers, to determining the difference between different pick numbers. Even if it's a very similar bill, there can be very subtle differences. Learn those pick numbers, or at least go to a website like PMG so you can see high color illustration, uh, high definition illustrations of these pieces and kind of learn the difference of those pick numbers. That's kind of the fundamental thing that you should know about currency. And you can see how these uh, transactions happened over several years where um, sometimes the piece that you like is the best piece, even if it's not the highest graded example that's out there. Sometimes it's that eye appeal. Sometimes it's that personal experience that comes into play and really, Everything about what we collect should be fun and exciting. Don't just rely on other people's information. Really put your own thought and energy into it. In this case, I love my 55 EPQ 100 string note, and it is definitely part of my permanent collection and will remain so, even though it's just the 11A pick number and not that inverted seal 11D that slipped through my fingers all those years ago. If you have any suggestions about other videos that you'd like to see me make in the World of Coin Collecting series, I would love to hear your comments. If there are other topics that interest you, I will take a look and see if I've got the knowledge base and the examples, and maybe we'll produce a video just based on your suggestion. If you have any comments or questions about the things that we talked about here today, uh, if uh, you have anything in particular that you'd like to ask me about these pieces, go ahead and leave a comment down below. I encourage you, if you are interested in the world of currency in this section of numismatics, to go to PMG's website, to go to PCGS's website. They do have a section where they grade bills as well, currency as well, two top tier uh, currency graders. You can find all sorts of information out there. Remember that research is free, it doesn't cost you anything. And if you think of it as part of your journey, as you go collecting coins, currency, cards, or whatever it is that you are fascinated with, you can really build up your experiences and that should be part of the joy of collecting. That's not just always pulling the trigger, it's the anticipation and the research that leads up to that decision where you have the confidence to know that you've done the research necessary. And as always, thank you for allowing me to be a part of your journey as you go deeper into the world of coins currency, and physical precious metals.